With that objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess at any time. Pursuant to House Resolution 8, today the committee is meeting virtually. I want to announce a couple reminders to the members about the conduct of this remote hearing. First, members should keep their video feed on as long as they are present in the hearing. Members are responsible for their own microphones. Please also keep your microphones muted unless you are speaking. Finally, if members have documents they wish to submit for the record, please email them to the committee clerk whose email address was circulated prior to the hearing. Good morning. Welcome to today's Environment Subcommittee hearing on Defining a National Ocean Shot, Accelerating Ocean and Great Lakes Science and Technology. It's World Ocean Month, and in keeping with the theme, we are holding this hearing a day before World Ocean Day and Capitol Hill Ocean Week. With the largest ocean property in the world, the United States is undoubtedly an ocean nation. My home state of New Jersey is a microcosm with 80% of New Jerseyans living in coastal areas. The coastal New Jersey economy employs almost 3 million people annually, earning over $188 billion. The oceans are not just important to our coastal communities, they are important to our inland communities as well, as they sustain all life on our planet. The oceans regulate the Earth's weather and climate system and sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Oceans are a major part of the solution to the climate crisis. They also supply over half of the oxygen we breathe, provide a major source of protein for billions of people, and produce life-saving pharmaceuticals. Human health is inextricably tied to ocean health, but ocean health is under siege. Climate change, ocean acidification, plastics pollution, overfishing, and other human activities are stressing our oceans. We need bold, ambitious, science-based solutions to these growing challenges. At today's hearing, we're going to hear from experts on their perspectives on the science that is needed most urgently, but also what our longer-term vision should be. We are at an important juncture for ocean science. This year marks the beginning of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This is an opportunity for the United States to think outside the box and define a bold, ambitious vision for advancing ocean science and technology to address major challenges such as climate change. Simply put, we need a moonshot equivalent for the ocean. We need an ocean shot. As we discussed on this subcommittee last Congress, we have better maps of the moon and Mars than we have of our seafloor. Two major challenges we face, the chronic underfunding of ocean science in the US and around the world, and that ocean science suffers from a lack of diversity. Ocean science is the least diverse of all of our STEM fields, with Black students representing less than 2% of graduates. A March 2021 House Science Committee Majority Staff Report found that less than 4% of NOAA scientists are Black, and only 1.3% are Black women. Investing in ocean science and innovations presents significant economic opportunities. In the US, the goods and services provided by the ocean, coast, and Great Lakes called the blue economy is valued at $373 billion. As this administration and Congress look to build back better, we have the opportunity to build back bluer. Opportunities for expanding ocean science also mean opportunities for job creation. So I wanna welcome our expert panel of witnesses today who will provide perspectives on critical ocean science and technology from federal, academic, nonprofit, and philanthropic sectors. I look forward to hearing their ideas for how the U.S. should engage in transformative, bold ocean research to help society. We ultimately need a collective effort to build partnerships, collaboration, and cooperation to achieve desired science and conservation outcomes. The oceans know no geopolitical boundaries and connect us all over the world. The U.S. should not only be the global leader in ocean science, but we should build international partnerships and scientific collaborations to increase our collective knowledge and global health. Given that the ocean benefits us all, advancing ocean science and technology can and should be a bipartisan issue. And I look forward to working with my colleagues to support these issues in Congress. So now I'd like to recognize ranking member Bice for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee and sharing their perspectives this morning. Public awareness around ocean science is at a peak right now. Tomorrow is World Oceans Day. This week, Capitol, um, Capitol Hill Ocean Week, 
June is National Ocean Month, and this year we kick off the start of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This is prime time for our subcommittee to capitalize on the heightened public attention our oceans and Great Lakes are receiving. Representing the landlocked state of Oklahoma, I admit I am not much of an expert when it comes to ocean science and technology, but that's why I'm excited to be here today to learn from our captivating panelists. Given that the ocean economy produces almost $300 billion in goods and services and employs more than 3 million people, it is impossible to deny there is a national trickle-down effect to areas that are landlocked. While I personally, I'm sorry, <clears throat> um, while I personally don't have much experience with ocean science, I do have firsthand experience with extreme weather. I was fascinated to learn how the most that most moist air that blows off the Gulf of Mexico is part of what makes Oklahoma Tornado Alley. As we hear our witnesses today discuss their ideas on what could make a great ocean shot for our nation to pursue, I understand that any such effort could result in improved weather forecasting and understanding of tornado formation. That is something that could save lives, money, and property in Oklahoma and other states that experience severe weather. Just as the moonshot led to many new and unexpected technology innovations, a well-coordinated ocean shot could spur breakthroughs in technology that benefit more than just marine science. The potential benefits could touch all aspects of society, including the economy, national security, public health, and more. Whether it's advanced sonar or automated drones, the technologies being used for ocean exploration can, in turn, offer benefits to industries life, like offshore oil production and wind energy generation. Creating silos, where technology is only developed for one purpose within the government, is the definition of wasted taxpayer resources. Furthermore, I'd like to discuss how the federal government can be a better partner with private industry, academia, nonprofits, and philanthropists to accelerate the translation of basic science into applied research and ultimately a marketable product. Just like the Department of Energy's basic research led to the fracking revolution by the natural gas industry, I hope that the NOAA is striving to conduct research that will benefit the United States economy for decades to come. Lastly, I wanna focus on how we can market the pursuit of STEM education to the next generation of scientists and explorers. We've heard in this committee before the challenges our nation is facing at remaining competitive and retaining talented young individuals in prominent science roles, especially women and minorities, and from those rural communities. We know that any ocean shot we try to achieve cannot be successful if we do not invest in the talent of tomorrow. We need to first make this field appealing and attractive to the brightest minds our country has to offer, and then have the pieces in place to provide them a top tier education on this subject. Ocean science is a wide ranging topic touching on everything from energy, critical min minerals, living resources and ecosystems. I look forward to hearing how the ocean science and technology enterprise can solve complex challenges and strengthen our nation and its communities. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, and we are um, happy to have the full committee chairwoman, Ms. Johnson, with us today. The chair now recognizes the chairwoman. Carol, for holding this important hearing on the future of ocean research in the United States, it is an exciting time to be discussing the ocean, given it is both the World Ocean Month and Capitol Hill Ocean Week. I'd also want to welcome my expert panel of witnesses and thank them for sharing their perspective with us today. Representing a landlocked city, that is until about a month ago, it's been raining a month here. I hope we'll still have landlocked when it's over. It has not decreased my appreciation for the importance of the world's oceans. A lot of attention is rightfully given to the impacts of extreme weather, sea level rise, and subsidence on coast communities. But the oceans also impact those of us who do not live in near oceans. It is important to realize that the weather we experience is greatly influenced by our oceans. Warmer oceans cause stronger hurricanes. 
They also can contribute to the extreme precipitation events. This can be led to damaging floods like the ones both in Texas and across the Midwest in recent years. Having a better understanding of our weather forecast, regardless of where we live, we also know the oceans have mitigated even worse impacts of climate change by absorbing much of the excess heat and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But this buffering effect has impacted ocean ecosystems. Absorption of carbon dioxide emissions by our oceans has led to more acidic environments that can harm marine organisms. This committee was instrumental in the passage of two bipartisan ocean acidification bills out of the House last month. These bills will help coastal communities and economies address the impacts of ocean acidification. There are many topics within the field of ocean science, but I expect ocean exploration will be a key part of our national ocean, ocean shot initiative. On this front, we're working on a bill to advance our national ocean exploration priorities. This bill will also support efforts to build a more inclusive and diverse ocean exploration enterprise. It is my hope that it would also be an enabler for increasing diversity in ocean sciences more broadly. It is clear that there is a lot of potential for the U.S. to become the global leader in ocean science and technology. I look forward to today's discussion on what our country's future ocean shot should be and how this committee can help the United States live up to our leadership potential in this area. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. If there are members who wish to submit additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Mr. Craig McLean. Mr. McLean is the Assistant Administrator for Oceanic and Atmospheric Research and Acting Chief Scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration within the US Department of Commerce. Mr. McLean is responsible for overseeing, directing, and implementing NOAA's research enterprise, including a network of research laboratories and NOAA programs in ocean and atmospheric fields. Mr. McLean serves as the U.S. Representative to the Intergovernmental Oceanograph Oceanographic Commission. He also serves on the Executive Planning Committee of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. He previously served in other leadership roles in NOAA and was founding director of the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research and served for nearly 25 years in NOAA's commissioned corps as captain. Our next witness is Dr. Margaret Leinen. Dr. Leinen is the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, vice chancellor for marine sciences and dean of the School of Marine Science at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Leinen is an award-winning oceanographer and leader in ocean science, global climate, and environmental issues. Previously, she served as vice provost for marine and environmental initiatives and executive director of Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. She also served as assistant director for geosciences and coordinator of environmental research and education at NSF. She's a member of the executive planning group of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and a fellow of numerous scientific societies. Our third witness is Dr. Michael P. Crosby. Dr. Crosby is the president and CEO of the Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, an independent research institution that has been a leader in marine research for 60 years. He has more than 30 years of multidisciplinary research, teaching and science management and leadership experience. And our final witness is Dr. Robert D. Ballard. Dr. Ballard is the president of the Ocean Exploration Trust and Explorer at Large with the National Geographic Society. He's best known for his discoveries of hydrothermal vents, the sunken RMS Titanic, and numerous shipwrecks. He's been a pioneer in the development of advanced exploration technology. Dr. Ballard was awarded with the National Endowment for the Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush in 2003 and is also a retired Navy officer. As our witnesses should know, you will each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. 
Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When you all have completed your spoken testimony, we will begin with questions. Each member will have five minutes to question the panel and we'll start with Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Cheryl and Chairwoman Johnson, Ranking Member Bice, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I speak here today as the acting chief scientist of NOAA and in my permanent position as assistant administrator for ocean and atmospheric research. I'm also the representative for the United States at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which created the decade of ocean science. Dr. Leinen and I, plus four other Americans, were among only 20 individuals selected globally who have guided the development of this decade of ocean science. And my commitment and greetings to our two other panelists, Dr. Ballard, who's a very close partner of ours in the inspiration and innovation of ocean exploration, and Dr. Crosby, who also has had quite a history, including NOAA. The writings of Rachel Carson and Jacques Cousteau gave warning and inspiration about the importance of our ocean environment. Those warnings produced environmental legislation to clean the air, the water, the ocean, and our environment and our economy have both prospered since. Today, America's blue economy is worth nearly $373 billion in GDP, as the chairwoman reminded us. But today's warnings again appear to include plastics pollution, pirate fishing, and those of the climate crisis, ecosystem tipping points, ocean acidification, coral death, harmful algal blooms, sea level rise, and others. In response, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission created the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. There has been a dearth of national and international investment in ocean science that I fear has generated consequences. We do not allow ourselves to think big enough. How is it that since 1960, the deepest diving vehicles in the United States have come from private individuals, James Cameron and Victor Vescovo, the oceans are not just a romantic curiosity. The oceans regulate climate, generate oxygen we breathe, and they control our weather. If you're in the agriculture sector of the heartland of America, your seasonal weather outlook is determined by what is happening in the Indian Ocean, half a world away. If you'd like your seven-day weather forecast, thank an oceanographer. The gaps we need to fill are more ocean observations and measurements with ships, aircraft, surface and undersea autonomous platforms, Argo floats, gliders, drifters, and then also the operational satellites. More scientific funding is necessary in order to enable the understanding of these observations. Both of these fuel and build better models that have to be developed and run on larger computers. And we do need a well-trained, innovative, transdisciplinary, diverse workforce. You will see all of these issues and items addressed in NOAA's fiscal year 2022 budget request to strengthen NOAA and the nation's dedicated ocean science agency. We should define our U.S. national ocean shot for the ocean decade by integrating these and other capabilities across the entire federal sector to simply and boldly make the ocean transparent. To know and understand the physical, the biological, chemical, geological, and even archaeological terms of the oceans. No more mysteries. Certain knowledge. Making the ocean transparent will require, number one, mapping, exploring, and characterizing the ocean. Not just the exclusive economic zone of the U.S., but the whole global ocean. Only 19% of the global ocean and less than half of our own EEZ have been mapped. The United States should lead the discovery of the world ocean. Number two, completely define the ocean's life and ecosystem. Plants, animals, bacteria, to the whales. Genetic material in the water, salt and fresh, can reveal the inventory of species and their interactions by simply sampling the water. We need to do this and we need not even see the creature. These omics technologies, once fully developed, would give us the pace of discovery needed to baseline our understanding of change from a warming climate. Number three, accelerate the use of our rich data holdings. Big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, exascale computing, all will enable further ocean discovery from within our existing and future holdings. Lastly, number four, the global decade of ocean science should be led decisively by the United States with a bold innovation, imagination, and actions approach. This will be a STEM recruitment moment and opportunity to inspire every young American, whether in the heartland or on the coast. Ocean science is exciting. Let's sell it. We can equally stimulate young people to put on blue jumpsuits and dream of space and oceans, even put them in a mask and snorkel, let them taste the salt and see the environment where real alien life forms have been found and where proven medical cures of the foundations from our life here on Earth have come from. This ocean decade will constitute a once in a career, if not once in a lifetime opportunity. The need for 
Global focus on oceans is upon us. Let the United States regain its leadership and may the ocean decade reveal secrets that today we cannot even imagine. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Dr. Linen. Thank you, Chair Cheryl, uh, Chair Johnson, Ranking Member Vice, and Subcommittee members. Thanks for the opportunity to testify during this hearing on defining a national ocean shot. You have all heard over the last few years about the key role that the ocean emphasized thinking boldly about a transparent ocean and has identified some of the ideas that he believes will contribute to that transparency, uh, mapping the seafloor and the biology of the ocean. I would emphasize that the reason it is so important to have a transparent ocean is to achieve predictability regarding impacts on the ocean and the ocean's impact on us. The biggest gap in our understanding of ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes science is our lack of ability to predict the consequences of the major changes that are affecting these essential aquatic environments. For example, while we know impacts of harmful algal blooms on coastal ecosystems and tourism, we don't know what triggers them and cannot predict them. We need to change that. We need to be able to predict the impact of changes in the ocean, like acidification, warming, deoxygenation. We need to be able to predict those impacts on our seafood and resources, whether they're from natural harvests or aquaculture. We need to be able to predict the impacts of natural hazards, hurricanes, tsunamis, sea level rise to a far greater degree than we can now. Our lack, of, our lack of predictability is costing us money every year. Money lost to flooding and erosion, money lost to beach closures, money lost to impacts of acidification on shell fisheries. In my state, California, just north of my university campus, California transportation authorities are debating about which of two multi-billion dollar plans will have to be adopted to move Amtrak lines that are currently within a few feet of a rapidly eroding coastal bluff that's being affected by both sea level rise and changing precipitation. Lives are at, lives are at stake as well. In the same area, three sunbathers were killed two years ago when a portion of a bluff failed. Achieving levels of predictability that can save money and lives certainly requires that we maintain and improve our existing ocean observing systems in the same way that we do our weather observing systems. Our current level of understanding and thus predictability requires these baseline observations. But for the future, we also need to begin observing the biology of the ocean with the same scale and frequency that we observe its circulation and physics. It requires that we take up new challenges like mapping the seafloor. And predictability requires that we connect those observations to predictive models that include both the biology and the ocean environment. Uh, as you've highlighted, in order to achieve this, we need to have opportunities for all to participate. It must be an inclusive and diverse workforce of people meeting these challenges. This is not impossible. Our entering class of PhD students this fall has 25% American people of color, including 10% black students. It, the, this still doesn't represent the demographics of the US, but it shows that we can make strides in this right now and we must. Last January, as, as you observed, we began the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. I can tell you firsthand that the US has shown great leadership in developing both the rationale for the decade, as well as the groundbreaking science and technology ideas that have been proposed for the decade. We have the opportunity to now leverage our US resources 
with the resources of other countries from around the world. It's a once in a generation opportunity to have our ocean shots made more affordable by the contribution of others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Leinen. And next we will go to Dr. Crosby. Thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl, uh, Chair Johnson, uh, Ranking Member Bice, members of the Subcommittee on Environment. I greatly appreciate your invitation and the opportunity to testify at this hearing on defining a national ocean shot. I provided much more comprehensive thoughts and recommendations on this important subject in my written testimony. And my comments today are provided in my role as president and CEO of a somewhat unique organization. Established in 1955, Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium is a completely independent nonprofit marine research and science education institution that for 66 years has pushed the frontiers of science for a noble cause, conservation and sustainable use of our oceans. Moat currently has over 260 staff, including 37 PhD level scientists conducting research at our six campuses throughout Florida and with partner institutions around the world. Moat is also a total soft money research and science education institution in that unlike universities and agencies, we must proactively secure all of our annual funding, primarily through competitive research grants, contracts and cooperative agreements and philanthropy. We also have no tenure, no guaranteed jobs, yet we have researchers with over 30 year careers at Moat. Moat believes that a national ocean shot should be aimed at achieving a vision that we have advocated of oceans for all by pushing forward the frontiers of science to develop innovative solutions for restoring, sustainably utilizing, and conserving the wealth of our ocean resources while also ensuring equity of transformational opportunities for experiential STEM education of all K-12 students and the broader public that will enhance the overall level of ocean literacy throughout diverse communities. Now, irrespective of the enormous economic, cultural, aesthetic, and general quality of life values that the ocean provides to each of us, everybody everywhere in the world, no matter where you live, is connected to the ocean, as our chair said in her opening remarks, with every breath you take, over 50% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the oceans, not land. Therefore, a national ocean shot that prioritizes science-based solutions to address the most pressing challenges facing our oceans is absolutely vital to our continued existence. A national ocean shot strategy for maximum impact beyond just pushing the frontiers of science will need to weave together four components. The specific ocean science and technology development foci that are most urgently needed, the importance of building more diverse, equitable, and inclusive ocean s and enterprises, the vital need for an enhanced level of ocean literacy throughout society, and the important role of independent nonprofit institutions as full partners with government and academia. Now, specific and most urgently needed science and technology development foci that should be included are the following six areas. Coral reef research and restoration, harmful algal bloom mitigation and technology development, evolution of science-based environmentally sustainable aquaculture, advancing electronic monitoring technologies for fisheries, impacts of ocean nanoplastics and coastal resiliency science and engineering. In addition, Building a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive ocean s and enterprise will bolster creative and collaborative solutions to all the grand challenges our oceans are facing. Unfortunately, only 10% of undergraduate geoscience marine STEM degrees are awarded to underrepresented minorities. The Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, Marine Science Laboratory Alliance, Center of Excellence, or MARCELACE for short, can serve as a model for a national ocean shot priority in developing and implementing a new paradigm for increasing underrepresented minority participation and success in marine STEM-related careers beyond that provided by traditional 
degree granting institutions. A novel aspect of Marcellase lies with independent marine research institutions having a distinct culture of innovation, independence, and entrepreneurship that is essential for the future underrepresented minority success in higher education research and careers in STEM. And in closing, it's worth noting that paradigms for funding and conducting science in the US have evolved considerably since World War II with the creation of NSF, a growing role for federal funding of research in the intervening decades, and now the growing importance once again of philanthropy and independent nonprofit research institutions, such as Moat Marine Laboratory. So given the somewhat unique role of these institutions, these not nonprofit independent research institutions, a National Ocean Shot Initiative should consider the critical value of these institutions and the vital niche role they play in enabling the US to stay at the forefront in the global research and innovation enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Dr. Ballard. I want to thank the uh, leadership of the subcommittee and its members for inviting me to speak today. I would like to begin with an interesting fact that few Americans know, and that is that 50%. Dr. Ballard, I'm having trouble hearing you. Despite this fact, we have better maps of Mars and the far side of the moon. I believe every classroom in America should have a detailed map of our country on its walls that shows all of our great country, not just the half that pokes up above sea level. Fortunately, Congress created the Office of Ocean Exploration within NOAA in 2004, but only recently has Congress begun giving that office the resources needed to map and characterize that 50% of our country. Is there anything we can do to improve uh, Dr. Ballard's sound? To the We're working on that. Thanks. Proposals that were submitted to this subcommittee, I found a glaring absence of innovative ideas, including the use of telepresence technologies and autonomous vehicles, including uncrewed surface ships for future ocean exploration and research. The Department of Defense and private industry are much farther down this road than the oceanographic community with DARPA's Sea Hunter and Ocean Infinity's Armada surface ships as well as uncrewed containerized ships that will soon be coming online. Clearly the oceanographic community- Sorry to interrupt. Also, if, if you are able to turn up your audio on your devices as well, that should also increase it if it's not all the way up. But sadly, they're not even thinking about such ships for the UNOL fleet. Last year during the height of the- So very quiet. Our ship of exploration, the EV Nautilus, put to sea when many other research ships did not. Thankfully, We'd already implemented the use of telepresence, which does not require the science team to be at sea. Telepresence is clearly a major step in the direction of future uncrewed research ships, and this year we'll begin moving the operational team ashore as well. When it comes to the blue economy, I believe the most important thing we need to focus on is feeding the growing population of the world. Noted Harvard sociobiologist E.O. Wilson warns us that there's a limit to how many people the world's farmlands can feed, even if all humans were vegetarians, and that limit is 10.5 billion people. According to the latest projections, we reach that number by the year 2050. This crisis could come even sooner than 2050, since we're using up so much farmland to house our growing population, and just last week, China encouraged its people to increase the number of children in their families by 50%, which this curve does not include. For the human race to survive, we need to move away from being a hunter-gatherer society at sea, and like we did on land over 2,000 years ago, become farming and herding at sea. To do this, we need to accelerate open ocean aquaculture in the tropics, where there are few fish living there naturally. We need to convert carnivores to herbivores and feed them sea-based plants instead of land-based plants. Their cages would be fully submerged far from land in deep water and managed by autonomous vehicle systems. 
When it comes to how we increase the engagement of underrepresented minorities in ocean science and technology, we need to start very early in their lives. Aquariums engage toddlers in the wonderment of the underwater world. We begin in middle school to engage all American children in live, interactive exploration in all possible venues. And equally important, we believe our core of exploration, which is now exploring the unknown America, has all the faces of our country in its ranks to serve as role models and mentors for the next generation. When it comes to involving more Native Americans and Hispanics in ocean exploration and technology, I would focus on their early history in America. We now know that Native Americans and many members of the Hispanic communities in our country today can trace their origins to the migration of humans across a land bridge called Beringia that formed some 22,000 years ago when vast glaciers covered the world's landmass, lowering sea level some 125 meters or 410 feet below its present level. As a result, there are vast areas of the U.S. continental shelf that were once occupied by the ancestors of today's Native Americans and many Hispanics living in our country today. Clearly, there should be more efforts to explore. Okay, I need to see my check. With I'm, I'm sorry for that uh, uh, problem. Can you hear me even better now? Finally, I want to uh, recommend cutting across many disciplines in the recommendations I've made which are supported by many different agencies within the federal government, including the Department of Commerce, Interior, Education, Defense, to name a few. For that reason, we need to place a greater emphasis upon interagency programs using organizations like the National Ocean Partnership Program. But again, I want to thank all of you for inviting me to testify before you today, and I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions you might have and my testimony that I just gave is also in written form. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so at this point, we will begin our first round of questions. I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, to begin, in the US, we've seen an increase in the number of devastating extreme weather events in the last few decades. NOAA reported that 2020 set a new annual record of 22 weather and climate disasters that caused at least $1 billion in damages. For one, our hurricane seasons are getting more powerful as climate change causes the oceans to warm, which fuels the hurricane intensity. And Mr. McLean, you mentioned that uh, weather changes in the Indian Ocean can affect the Midwest. And if you like our seven day forecast, thank an oceanographer. So how exactly do ocean measurements help us better understand weather patterns and improve predictions of hurricanes and other extreme weather events? Well, thank you, Chairwoman Cheryl. The, the, it, as a former aviator, I think you're very, very sensitive to that ocean and atmospheric interaction and that the oceans really do drive weather. For 50 years, NOAA celebrates now its 50th anniversary, we've been studying that air-sea interaction. That was the purpose of creating our agency, among several others. And what we've come after that 50 years is a much better understanding of that air-sea interaction. So by establishing the types of observing systems and monitoring systems that Dr. Leinen spoke of, we've been able to see not just the correlation, but the causation of activities that are ocean atmosphere interruptions, disruptions, changes that are then experienced all the way across the Pacific and onto America's heartland as far as the East Coast and even into Europe. Global circulation is the key to understanding local events, when and how they will occur, and the key to our enhancing that understanding to give you better forecasts in the coast of New Jersey is to be understanding this, this complete global circulation, more monitoring, more analysis, that'll be get better models, and we need larger computers in order to run them. Those observations are key to understanding the weather. Thanks so much. So you, you listed a couple of the gaps in ocean science or technology that we need to fill. Um, are there any others besides more computers? Um, we've talked a little bit about the, the lack of diversity that we're working on. Um, wh where are the gaps that we need to fill? I believe most of those you see as a starting point in what each of the, the testimonies has been given here today. I think we all agree on so many of those, those commonalities. What I would offer to you is that NOAA, as the Civilian Ocean Science Agency of the United States, NOAA is a $12 billion agency trapped in a $5.5 billion budget. 
when I compare that to all of the objectives that we have responsibly been allocated to us by Congress through authorizations, if I stack all those authorizations up and what we're supposed to be doing, we just can't afford to do them all. And we don't work in isolation. We're not a, a solo act as a federal agency. We work with other federal agencies, of course, but we also provide much of our, our funding and we enjoy the fruits of the academic community, places like Dr. Linen's institution, Dr. Ballard's institution, Dr. Crosby's institution. We fund all of these components and get much value from it. We're just not doing enough. So those gaps are in the areas already identified for us to be taking action. But to fill those gaps, we need more resources than we have available. Thanks. And then, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we spend relatively little on ocean science. In fact, a fraction of a percent of our GDP is allocated to ocean science. And a recent UN report by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission reported that the global average for ocean science spending is only 1.7% of GDP. It also found that countries with the strongest relative growth in ocean science over the last few years included China, Iran, India, and Korea, but not the United States. So, Mr. McLean, again, it's my understanding there's no dedicated funding to support the U.S.'s activities during the ocean decade. How will these activities be funded? How much does the U.S. need for ocean science compared to what we're currently spending? And, and what would it take to have a national ocean shot? Chairwoman, I, I believe that uh, a good analogy could be that the cost of mapping the world ocean as developed by experts far beyond my own, or expertise far beyond my own, is that the rough approximate cost of a Mars mission would be what it takes in order to map the world ocean, and that the United States leadership could be attained in order to achieve that, but roughly $3 billion. And uh, I, I'll not put them on the spot, but I believe my colleague, Dr. Ballard, might have further analysis and information on, on deriving some of those numbers. But the level and scale of what we're spending right now is more like 50 to $80 million a year to be mapping. And at that rate, you could multiply by time and see how long it's going to take us to get there. To, to fund the ocean decade, there is no pot of money. No nation has yet allocated a specific pot of money, but at the interagency level in the United States, with Navy, NASA, NOAA, NSF, and other agencies, we're looking at prioritizing what may arise as these ocean opportunities, because they will indeed be highly leveraged as, as several of your, your members of the committee have said, and several panelists as well, this will be a highly leveraged opportunity. So now is a good time for us to be making investments at the federal level, either with the initiative of the, of the executive branch or the congressional and, and legislative branch, to find some, some opportunity to fund, some pot of money to fund, which could easily be distributed through the National Ocean Partnership Program, as I believe Dr. Crosby mentioned and Dr. Linen. So we have the vehicles, we have the methods, we can do this. Well, thank you so much, and I'm afraid my time has expired. Um, before we proceed, I want to bring the subcommittee's attention to a letter for the record from owner, CEO, and chief submersible pilot of Caledon Oceanic LLC and retired U.S. Navy commander, Mr. Victor Vescovo. Mr. Vescovo's letter expresses support for this hearing, states that the U.S. is no longer the clear leader in ocean research, and discuss discusses his ocean shot recommendation of comprehensively mapping and characterizing the entire U.S. exclusive economic zone. His letter also offers recommendations for how the U.S. can succeed, including making marine research permitting more efficient and engaging the fast-acting private sector. So without objection, I am placing this document in the record, and I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Weiss, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cheryl. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. McLean, you, you mentioned the cost of mapping would be approximately $3 billion, and you touched on the time frame. How long would it actually take to complete that mission? I believe we could accomplish that in a decade for two reasons. One is the number of survey systems that are available that, that could be accessed, but even more so, the opportunity to increase technology to be delivering better, better methods, better products than we have today would be the inspiration of such an ocean shot, much as the space shot, the moon shot, was the inspiration for so many technologies that have been the fruits of the investments that the aerospace industry had invested. So I, I think there will be a logic that follows that we won't use today's technology. And over the course of the decade, of the decade, excuse me, 
that we'll be having the the entree and the inspiration for innovators in the country to be building and making new tools to do this in a more automated way, a less fuel consuming way, and also less personnel dependent. It would lower the cost. And this is um, for any of our panelists. Can you talk a little bit about the collaboration with other countries in either trying to map or using technology to, to research um, the ocean? Dr. Ballard? Yes, uh, it is sort of ironic that we uh, are being funded by NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration to map the exclusive economic zone. And in our particular case, focusing on the Central Pacific and Western Pacific, where a tremendous amount of Americans' real estate is located, we literally have to turn our sonars off when we transit through other nations. And these nations lack the resources to map their own EEZs. I see a, a, a great opportunity for America to do what we used to refer to as soft power and help those other nations map their own countries instead of having us transit through those countries EEZs with our systems turned off. Do you believe there's a collaborative opportunity there for us to work with those countries to actually achieve that goal? Absolutely. They lack the resources. Some of these countries, 90% of their nations, Karabat, for example, 90% of that nation's land is beneath the sea, and they lack any of the technologies that we have to actually map and characterize theirs. Because after we map and characterize, we then move into the blue economy phase to take advantage of what we've learned. And just imagine that if you help them uh, do that, they might be very interested in helping you go to the next level. So I think it's just smart business. This was brought up in a couple of uh, the opening statements about science-based agriculture or ocean farming. Can you talk a little bit about where we are right now with ocean farming and what the potential could be? Uh, certainly we see um, the decrease in farmland uh, across the United States. What are the opportunities that, that we have for that um, particular industry? Well, well, certainly Michael and Moak Marine Labs has been doing pioneering work in this area. I know that some uh, new open ocean aquaculture is being done off Western Florida. What's in, important about it is that you're looking at real estate, particularly in the tropics. There's a program called the Valella Project that worked off the uh, a big island of Hawaii off the Kona coast, where they're out in tropical water that has very low nutrients. So you're not competing with the uh, ecosystems in those waters. And they're taking what are very expensive fish that we pay at sushi restaurants, so we call it uh, 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 yellowtail sushi, and we pay $7, $17.50 a pound for that uh, wholesale. And we pay uh, $1.50 uh, $1 for a pound of pork. So if you look at the value of those ecosystems and they flip them from being carnivores at the top of the food chain to herbivores at the bottom by feeding them now more and more ocean plant-based food. So it's scalable to a very large level because the largest living space on our planet is in the high seas in the midwater zone. So this is a simple solution that can be brought up, brought online, but it's not happening. Dr. Crosby. Congressman Bryce, if I could add to that. Um, the United States imports over 90% of the seafood that we consume in this country. Well over 50% of that is aquaculture. The overwhelming majority of that is from China. Um, the United States has a pitiful track record, as does most of the world, when it comes to open ocean aquaculture. But the technologies that have been developed over the past decade for open water uh, aquaculture, as well as land-based recirculating systems, has advanced rather significantly. This is one of the greatest opportunities for our country to grow a whole new economy, uh, it's an issue of food security. It's an environment. It's an environmental sustainability issue, and we have the technologies to move forward with this now. And this should really be a priority within an ocean shot. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Next, I recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question after I make a statement for each of uh, the uh, witnesses. President Kennedy's moonshot speech excited Americans with the goal of landing human on the moon. It sparked the curiosity of a nation in space exploration. 
It has been argued that a similar ocean shot is needed to spark the nation's curiosity about our oceans. In terms of defining a large multidisciplinary goal for ocean science and technology, I'd like to ask each of you uh, to briefly articulate your concept of a national ocean shot and why it matters. I know, uh, Ms. McLean, I'll start with you. You got close to commenting on something that's short. Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson. I believe that it would be to fully map, explore, and characterize the ocean to the point where we have no longer any mysteries of what is in the ocean. And this would take a lot of people, take a, a fair bit of time, and sufficient funding, significant funding, in order to make this happen. But until we really know the planet, the submerged portion of the planet, here we are as managers in your committee and other committees of jurisdiction, trying to give recommendations for how we manage the patient, the ocean, because of our human influences on it. We don't have the Gray's anatomy of the ocean. We don't have the full pulse and respiration of the ocean until we do this work. And until we get that, we won't really know how to handle and take care of the patient, which gives us life. Thank you. Savannah. Add to that, we, uh, you know, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. And I'm a 13th generation American, and I was brought up on the history of the Lewis and Clark expedition. When Jefferson acquired the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon, he doubled the size of the United States of America and launched that great uh, two-year expedition. And we know how much it changed the economy of our nation. We now have done that again in acquiring the USEEZ. We have, uh, we have now doubled again the size of America. And as we export, we will change the economy of our country once again. Uh, he called his core of exploration, uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, our core, uh, the team of our ships of exploration that are doing the second expedition, we call it the Lewis and Clark expedition because 55% of our team are women in positions of, of authority. And as you saw in that image, we're able through our telepresent technology to engage all children in this historic expedition that will take the next 10 years. So talk about a ocean shot, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Johnson, I'll uh, add to that by saying that we need to go beyond mapping and seeing what's there in, in the geographic sense uh, to understanding what's there in the biological sense. Uh, and not just uh, mapping what we can see, the large organisms, but also that, that uh, unseen microbial world of the ocean uh, that really controls so many of the interactions between the organisms and ourselves. Uh, I like to say, you know, it's a, uh, the, the, the microbes own the world. They just uh, like to have us around because we're great hosts. Uh, and and uh, that's true for the ocean as well. Uh, so the, uh, this idea of being able to actually define uh, what is in the ocean, as well as the various parts of the ocean and mapping them, is really critical for this ocean shot. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could just uh, add two cents worth here uh, on this. Nobody on this panel will disagree that um, pushing the frontiers of science should be and must be a priority uh, for this ocean shot. But I would suggest that there's both a strategic uh, perspective that should be addressed as well as a more tactical perspective. Strategically, things like mapping the entire seafloor, this is pushing the frontiers of science. No question about it. It's, it's an exciting thing that should be done. But at the same time, we are witnessing now the functional extinction right before our eyes of coral reefs in Florida and around the country. We are witnessing right now harmful algal blooms that are decimating the environment, public health, our quality of life and the economy. And we're also witnessing rising sea levels that are really creating significant challenges to coastal communities all around the nation. And I would suggest that part of the ocean shot must be to harness the national research and engineering enterprise 
to address these most urgent problems as well. And I would further state that we must engage the public in this. We must enhance the level of ocean literacy amongst the broader public to understand the importance of the science and the connections with the oceans. And we're not gonna do that through peer reviewed science publications. We need to engage more of the aquariums and museums around the country in telling the story and translating and transferring science from the ocean shot. Thank you very much. Your, all of your testimony has been excellent. I appreciate you being here and I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, now I am going to defer to committee counsel for the order of recognition. Mr. Feenstra is recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Cheryl and Ranking Member Bice. And I wanna thank the witnesses for their testimony and sharing their extensive research and experience with us. Although my district is not near the coast or the Great Lakes, we do have rivers and lakes and watersheds and fisheries in Iowa that are crucial to our economy. Additionally, improving our knowledge of ocean currents and temperatures will help us create and better predict our weather in the Midwest, which also helps our real economy and, and uh, my district. So this is a qu question for all the witnesses. While my district may not touch the ocean or Lake Michigan, we are home to the Missouri River and our own Great Lakes in Iowa. I would like to know how advances made in ocean front might also benefit inland waterways. For example, in 2019, the Missouri River flooded three times, causing significant damages to Iowans that we're still recovering from today. Are there any ocean shock proposals for flood prevention and building community resilience in such disasters like these? Uh, and I'd like to ask anyone that could answer that. Congressman Feenstra, I'll, I'll certainly defer to my panelist colleagues shortly to follow, but from the ocean shot proposals that, that have come to our attention so far, I think the bigger picture approach of recognizing how greater ocean observations and understanding what they mean, greater density of observations, to really fill out some of the systems that we have today, we'll give our friends in Iowa, whether they be transportation sector, agricultural sector, lake residents, the, the insults that the, the land living people have, have endured are more easily forecast in the future. And something that's very much part of what we're looking at here and across all federal agencies resilience in the coastal environment, which includes the lakes, resilience is top priority. How do we let those citizens who have chosen to live within the vulnerable reach of coasts, whether it be a lake coast or, or saltwater coast, but also people in the middle of the heartland who may not have a body of water next to them. The resilience to climate change is very much a part of what we're looking for as the products of this science. And when we can tell people what is coming whether it's the finance industry, the reinsurers, or the homeowner and the mayor, knowing what is coming and building your community or your personal property or your business to be responsive to that future is very important. And we're committed to be delivering that. NOAA is at the center of this with our climate service information and the academic colleagues that support us throughout the sector of the university community, including each of the panelists, organizations that are, that are with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thought on that from anyone? Yes. Uh, at this very minute, my team is in Lake Huron. Uh, we're working to map, uh, working with the uh, Thunder Bay uh, uh, Marine Sanctuary there, which was massively increased. As you know, Thunder, uh, Thunder Bay and the Great Lakes are very unique in that because they're fresh water, shipwrecks are perfectly preserved. And so we're now going through a very systematic use of the very technology we developed for ocean exploration to apply it to Great Lakes exploration. And we're also doing that entire operation live. So yes, we see the Great Lakes as a, an underwater museum of, of, of American history, and we need to make sure we understand it and preserve it. Thank you. Um, this would be a question to all the witnesses also. On, on another similar note, uh, again, coming from the Midwest, one of my many priorities in Congress of promoting and enhancing wind energy and renewable fuels. 
Are there any emerging ocean technology ideas that these energy spaces could also be utilized in a lake or a river environment? Is there anything out there that uh, we can garner from ocean technology? I'll offer other colleagues an opportunity to speak. Uh, I've, I've been getting most of the questions, but um, I'm pleased to defer. All right, perhaps, Congressman, we can we can get back to you with some ideas. And I think from across the federal sector, the, the ideas of technologies that are emerging with Department of Energy and commercial sector, there are probably a good number of technologies, but um, the, the ones that we're focused on right now are more on the ocean front. But by looking at hydrothermal or thermal based energy and um, and also wind. I, I could imagine that there's a lot to discuss here, but we would look forward to having a more comprehensive answer for you in the future. Yeah, and, and you know, we're considering, I know in oceans, there's also algae technology that's being used in the biofuels industry. And uh, we're playing with that also in the Midwest when it comes to algaes and, stuff and things like that. So I think there's a lot of collaboration that could be done uh, by uh, what's happening in the ocean and then also what's happening in the Midwest when it comes. To, and then also wind. I mean, we we do so much with wind here, but, you know, you look at the vastness of oceans and how we could capture the wind that's coming off oceans and things like that. So uh, I would truly engage uh, those that, that are on the call to to, uh, you know, look at those type of things. So thank you so much. I yield back. Ms. Bonamici is recognized. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Cheryl and Ranking Member Bice and uh, holding this hearing during National Ocean Month. And thank you to our witnesses. We know, as you've established in the, in the testimony, that every person on this planet benefits from a healthy ocean. And I appreciate the discussion today about why ocean health is important to everyone, not just those of us who represent coastal districts. The ocean drives our economy feeds, employs, and transports us, and the power of its waves generates clean energy. And as we recognize the inaugural year of the UN Decade of Ocean Science, I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee, with leadership at NOAA and the scientific community to protect and preserve the ocean and to rapidly accelerate the collection, management, and dissemination of ocean data. So uh, tomorrow, to recognize World Oceans Day, I'm going to reintroduce my Bipartisan Blue Globe Act uh, with my fellow uh, co-chair of the House Oceans Caucus, uh, Congressman Young. Uh, for those members who are on this uh, in this hearing today, if you're not already a member of the House Oceans Caucus, uh, I invite you to join us. Uh, our bill tasks the National Academy of Sciences with assessing the potential for an, an advanced research project agency oceans or ARPA-O uh, because we need to overcome the long-term and high-risk barriers in the development of ocean technology. So I'm gonna ask Mr. McLean, how would ARPA-O help drive the advances in ocean science and technology that are necessary to contribute to our national ocean shot goals? And what steps is NOAA currently taking to scale up ocean observations and exploration. Congresswoman Bonamici, thank you so much for your support for many of the programs that you mentioned and the, the opportunities that are before us. In terms of an ARPA-O, I think it would be wonderful for this government, for the United States, to be proffering such, such an instrument because it would change the tolerance for risk. In order to have an ARPA-like approach, almost by definition, one has to surrender the timidity with which we generally approach federal science programs and give us that courage to have the, the innovative risk-taking possibly failing in order to learn something. And we don't have that today. I think the paucity of resources leaves us with a remarkably um, diminished uh, risk tolerance. So I think that would be one very positive step. The other one I'd mention in terms of what the federal community is doing, including, of course, NOAA as the principal civilian ocean science agency, is that we're embracing more the National Ocean Partnership prospect. And once again, thank you to the Congress for giving us the tools to further expand the utility of the National Ocean Partnership Program. So by looking at, as I believe Dr. Ballard and Dr. Crosby each mentioned, looking at philanthropy 
as a ready partner, looking at the commercial sector as a ready partner and other components, we have instead traditionally just been relying on two or more federal agencies to sponsor the Ocean Partnership Program activities. But by broadening that, we, I think, will be much more successful. Now, I'm not saying that NOP would equal ARPA-O, but what I can say is you combine the two together and you really take an, an all all hands on deck approach, as we are with climate science under the, the current administration, I think we get there. I think we have a wonderful opportunity to get there. Thank you. So much. That's very helpful. And Dr. Leinen, after the stark findings in the latest IPCC special report on the ocean and Christ here in a changing climate, we know that ocean data and monitoring are critical in assessing and adapting to the climate crisis. So I appreciate the acknowledgement in your testimony that we understand the effects of uh, environmental stressors like harmful algal blooms, marine heat waves, ocean acidification, hypoxia, but there's still a significant gap in our understanding of how to predict this phenom these phenomena, as you mentioned. So coastal communities, including those I represent in Northwest Oregon, are acutely aware of this gap. So how can Congress better support not only basic ocean science and observation, but also adaptation and mitigation research necessary to support coastal communities affected by the climate crisis? Uh, thank you, Representative Bonamici. Uh, yes, I think that much of the community has uh, started to turn to look at adaptation as well as understanding, uh, because we know that it's going to be necessary. And uh, as an example, uh, my own uh, university uh, has a Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation that focuses on partnerships with our uh, local and regional uh, communities to uh, look, for example, at their adaptation to sea level rise. And we're not the only ones. This is going on around the country. It's very important. And I think that uh, this is a place where we really need to use uh, all of the partnerships that are available to us. NOAA has a, 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 an important role to play uh, but they can't do all of it. Universities have an important role to play in developing new ways of adaptation, uh, but we can't do all of it. And I think that Congress can really help by fostering those connections and, and emphasizing partnerships uh, uh, and actually funding partnerships uh, that, that work effectively to do this. Uh, I'd also like to comment on your question about an ARPA-O, uh, because in, in, your, uh, in your questions to all of us, you asked us to comment on the idea of an ocean internet of things. Uh, and we're used to this idea uh, on land and uh, all of our devices communicating with each other, uh, but that's not possible in the ocean uh, right now. We have tens of thousands of sensors and instruments in the ocean and they can't talk to each other uh, because the electromagnetic uh, uh, transmission in the ocean uh, doesn't work very well. It doesn't work over long distances. A few months ago, we all sat in front of our televisions and watched a new rover land on Mars. And we actually saw uh, with a few minutes delay uh, the process of that taking place because it was communicating with, with satellites, it was communicating with other devices on Mars and communicating back to us. We can't do that in the ocean unless there's a wire attached to that sensor or instrument that goes to the surface or goes to a mooring and then goes up to a satellite and then back down. That's the only way that instruments could talk to each other. But there are, are exciting ideas about new ways of transmission and new mechanisms for transmission that could be uh, looked at to, to really create an ocean internet of things as well as a land-based internet of things. Terrific, thank you so much. And thanks to the chair for your indulgence and in letting me run over a bit for that wonderful answer. Thank you again, I yield back. Mr. Kildee is recognized. Thank you very much. And thank you to Chairwoman Cheryl for hosting this really important hearing. Uh, I come from Michigan, as you may know, uh, and so I'll, I'll talk about the Great Lakes, which for us is our lifeblood, but it also literally outlines the shape of our state, defines who we are as a people. So I'm really happy. Uh, I was happy to hear uh, Dr. Ballard's reply to the question from Mr. Feenstra, and I'd like to pursue a little bit more uh, regarding the specific issues uh, regarding the Great Lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes are central 
uh, not only to defining who we are as a people, uh, we, we rely upon them for the essentials of life, but also for our livelihoods. According to the Great Lakes Seaway Partnership, shipping on the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway supported $35 billion in economic activity in 2017. Detailed maps are important for enabling safe and efficient transportation and shipping, uh, particularly when it comes to protecting the environment. Uh, last year, my legislation that I authored along with Senator Gary Peters, the Great Lakes Environmental Sensitivity Index Act became law. This bipartisan legislation prioritizes and updates federal mapping of the Great Lakes, which are used to respond to emergencies and to protect habitat, species, structures that are most likely to be impacted by a potential spill or some other uh, sort of disaster. The Environmental Sensitivity Index maps for the Great Lakes are maintained by NOAA. Environmental Sensitivity Index maps are detailed guides that highlight vulnerable locations. Uh, NOAA, for example, announced just recently at a field hearing that the agency updated the SI maps for two specific priorities in the Great Lakes, priority areas that is, including the Mackinac Straits. Other maps in the Great Lakes, however, have not been updated some for decades. So Mr. McLean, if I could start with you, can you give us a bit of an update on the environmental sensitivity index maps in the Great Lakes when where we stand on that? Congressman, thank you very much for, for first your leadership in, in recognizing the importance of that opportunity and, and secondly for, for raising generally the notion of mapping in the Great Lakes. The area inside of NOAA that has primary responsibility for those activities is one we that I work very closely with because there is a science connection, but I'll be happy to give you a follow-up and more detailed explanation of the exact schedule of where we're going. But let me reside, or rely back on a point I made earlier. Without the leadership that, that your legislation provided, including the authorization of appropriations, the recommended funding level, we're at a point where we can't do it all and trying to figure out the triage order or the highest priority is something that we have been entertaining. And after several events up in the lakes that I know you're, you're I'm sure very familiar with, we've been looking at the modeling in and around certain areas where pristine shorelines versus the possibility of spills might be implicated. And uh, principally, the area of leadership for this activity is the Office of Response and Restoration, which are our experts in valuing and also guiding the chemistry to clean up such, such spill events. But our Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory is very involved in that, as well as our Sea Grant components and the many other aspects of the NOAA programs. But we'd be very happy to follow up with you with more detailed answers, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Ballard, since you mentioned the lakes, I wonder if you might comment that I'd be interested in the position others could offer uh, about how much of the Great Lakes remain unmapped or unexplored. We, we obviously know that there's a lot of area uh, in our oceans uh, globally that are unexplored. And we assume that the Great Lakes must be fully mapped and explored. But what we know that's not the case. What sort of technologies or resources do you all believe um, are needed in order to finish that? process. We, you're, ac you're accurate, Congressman. A tremendous amount of the Great Lakes has not been mapped in any sufficient detail. I might point out that the expedition we're conducting right now in your state or off your state is being all run from land. The vehicles are all autonomous, supported by drones. Uh, biggest part of our costs in ocean exploration is the ship. We're not using a ship. We're able to do it all remotely. And I think that that will greatly accelerate the rate at which we finish the Great Lakes. They could be done much rapid, more rapidly if we reverted to doing it all from land with uh, autonomous surface ships. Like uh, I, I mentioned, uh, surface, autonomous surface ships. We're working with the University of New Hampshire to make this all happen. They're experts in the development of these new vehicle systems. And we have a new one coming online this year that can go back into the, into the Great Lakes and map at an even higher uh, accuracy and at a greater speed. Any other comments from the other panelists before we I yield back? It's like my time's expired as it is. Thank you so much. I, I love this committee and this is a good example of why I do this uh, fascinating uh, hearing. Thank you and I yield back. Ms. Fletcher is recognized. 
Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to Chairwoman Cheryl for hosting this really important hearing. Thank you to all the witnesses. This has been a really useful and informative hearing. Um, and these issues are vitally important to people in my district in Houston, as well as the entire Gulf Coast region, um, where this is such a huge uh, part of our, our lives and our livelihoods. And um, and I, I'm really pleased and proud that uh, some of the most important legislation that we took up in the last Congress and again um, in this Congress relates to uh, issues of, uh, relating to uh, ocean science. And um, and I also want to acknowledge the the leadership of my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, who's been just a really tremendous leader on, on these issues. So really glad to be with all of you today to hear your thoughtful questions. And I want to follow up on some of the questions that um, Mr. Kildy just asked because he talked about maps and the and the Great Lakes, which is uh, obviously important. I have a little bit different angle um, on maps. There are a number of ocean technology industries with footprints headquarters um, in my district, including the geodata company Fugro, um, which is a major contributor to ocean mapping data uh, to the ocean decade, and also Ocean Power Technologies. Uh, which is a U.S. company focused on innovative ocean energy technology. Um, and I've been there. I've visited with them. I've seen um, some of the really incredible things that they're doing and um, think it's really exciting and that there are a lot of opportunities to partner here, which is, of course, something so important uh, to those of us in our district. So uh, my first question, I guess, is directed to Mr. McLean. How can NOAA better leverage private sector partnerships with companies like these to support ocean science? Congresswoman, your, your two examples are fantastic because the technologies that are available through those two companies and others, certainly in the Houston area, that have grown in some cases out of the oil industry are really applicable to civilian science. And there's a huge opportunity there. We, we looked at um, using the professional societies to get greater engagement between, for example, NOAA program managers and the technologies available. I think there is at times a, a propensity to look with a lean budget and say, well, my gosh, we can't afford to do something different than what we're doing today. But we're learning how to get out of that trap. And we're realizing that bringing program managers in, in confluence with the providers of such technology, including Ocean Power Tech and, and Fugro, it is an opportunity for us. We actually hosted at several of the OCEANS conferences. They're sponsored by the Marine Technology Society and the um, IEEE Ocean Engineering Society every year. And we, we hosted a seminar, How to Do Business with NOAA. It was one of the most popular seminars that has been ever launched at those conferences. And people really came to understand that working with certain federal agencies is not the exact same way you work with other federal agencies. And being able to explain that and open it is, is really, I think, the key. We're committed to it. We realize that where such partnership is. And let me just highlight Fugro for a second. Fugro is donating ocean mapping data, as is Dr. Ballard, as are Dr. Linen's people. But Fugro is a commercial company, doesn't have to do this. And they are with the spirit of advancing our knowledge of the of the ocean. So it, there's a remarkable opportunity in the public private sector. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that and for specifically highlighting um, Fugro, which is uh, headquartered right here in my district and um, is doing just really, um, really thoughtful work. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's been such a successful um, partnership and collaboration really. And I guess that's a question I'd love to follow up with any of the other witnesses if you want to weigh in kind of on this issue or whether it's your view that it's necessary for the government to either be more flexible or do anything differently uh, or perhaps novel to work more effectively in these kind of public private partnerships. And if so, uh, are there specific suggestions you would make uh, for how to do that and anything you think we should be doing in Congress to help make that possible? Look, Dr. Ballard, looks like you have your well, as you know, uh, I have a long history in academia, but an equally long history with the National mm -hmm. Geographic Society. And their leadership now has changed dramatically uh, just within recent months during the, the pandemic. And I encourage you to reach out to the leadership of the society because it's moving much, much closer to the academic view of, of exploration. And they're contributing significantly, not only in mounting expeditions, uh, we've done a number of expeditions with them, uh, but they're also making a major commitment. Dr. Uh, Vicki Phillips, who's the new educational officer at National Geographic, wants to reach 28 million children, and we're mounting major programs with them because of the, te 
the technology of telepresence, we're able to go into any classroom in the United States at will, but we needed sponsors. And here's a private sector organization, National Geographic, stepping up to the plate and offering to reach vast numbers of people. And while I have the podium here, I didn't get a chance in my speech to talk about a particular aspect of the underrepresented community. Please read my, uh, my full testimony. I'm dyslexic and I believe it's a very underrepresented community and you'll find in the ocean world, a significant large number of dyslexics. And I think this is a, a, a kind of a, a, a initiative that's cross all parties. Look at the dyslexic caucus in your house and you'll see every persuasion of, of, of representatives there. And I see an opportunity for uh, bipartisan activities on reaching the dyslexic community. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ballard and for your, your full testimony touching on this issue and others and your testimony here now. Thanks to all of you, I have exceeded my time, uh, but I do thank you all for your submissions and for your really thoughtful work. And again, Chairwoman Cheryl, thank you for holding this hearing and I yield back. Perfect. Mr. Kasten is recognized. Thank you so much. This is fascinating as always, uh, as I would expect from our illustrious chairwoman. Um, Mr. McLean, I, I want to I try to focus on climate change and particularly, you know, areas where we have, where at least from my vantage point, not yours, please chime in if you disagree, sort of the highest ratio of gaps in our knowledge to potential impacts. Um, and the, the first one is if you could just help me, and, and I, I ask this in the context of where should we be funding and where, you know, where should we be focusing a little bit more strongly. But first one is how, how comfortable are you that we have a, a good understanding of, of changes in temperature and CO2 at depth and the impacts of mixing and how big a deal on that is, is if, we are, if we have gaps in, in that knowledge. Congressman, we have labels of confidence in the IPCC, for example, and I'd have to refer you back and do a little bit more homework to give you that label of confidence. But I would offer you right now that we need to do much more work there in order to be looking at the climate cycle and the ocean climate cycle with carbon. So that, um, that's an area that we need more measurements. We need more opportunities to establish monitoring networks and such. One of the uh, key issues that we talk about is climate uh, climate related carbon sequestration. And as we look at the great Atlantic conveyor belt, as it's described, or the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, that's up in the Northern hemisphere. And we have the same in the Southern hemisphere. As we start to watch that slow down, that's very concerning to our European colleagues because that's what keeps those high latitude countries a little bit warmer from the Gulf Stream influence. If that slows down, what effects might await us? Further, if it slows down, how will the carbon that's taken into deep water and sequestered because of the organic activity in the upper ocean, how will that change? We need to know that a little bit better. So that's an area that I think warrants the kind of ARPA-O discussion that we were having or, or, or other type of innovative research to be putting more monitoring, more study of chemical and, and physical process, and then being able to see what that tells us for the longer term climate. In the near-term climate, I think we're pretty good at um, being able to project what, what scale and resolution of accuracy we can project. But for, for the longer-term effects, that's a necessary area of investment. Well, you have no surprise. You have exactly understood the reason I asked the question. That I've, you know, I've seen for years these discussions of Gulf Stream should slow down, maybe even stopping, maybe migration. Can you, can you help our panel understand it, you know, a little bit more tangibly what's at stake if that shows down and how it impacts our, our own climate and, and where the gaps are? Like, what do we need to know more to actually be able to predict if this is a big problem or just something that's scary but unlikely? At the broad stroke level, we're pretty good at understanding what the situation is. That situation is indeed concerning and there are no off ramps to this. We, we have to figure a way through this. If we look and realize that the ocean absorbs about 25% of the carbon dioxide into the ocean itself, just in the chemical gradient, there's a greater concentration in the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs it. That's changing the pH of the ocean. That means the ocean is getting more acidic. That's that is compromising the life cycle of many small, small organisms and even larger organisms that calcify. So by not understanding this fully, we're not able to give the kind of forecast for how people could hopefully mitigate, but perhaps even at a larger scale, look at the cause of this. What is causing the CO2 buildup? It, it is our current global 
energy source. And, and that informs policymakers that go beyond my ability or, or my domain, but we're just responsible for providing that science. The more mm-hmm. science we can generate to inform the right path forward for policymakers, the, the more informed our nation will be and the better decisions and choices we'll make. But the, the carbon buildup in the ocean, it's, it's acidification, it's a compromise of coral reefs, which are a lifeblood. Dr. Crosby was talking about the concerns for coral reefs. There are many impacts on coral reefs now, acidification being just one of them. And we also have a shellfish industry that is that's rooted in the ability to be predictable. This is a great disruptor of that prediction. But when we start talking about global circulation scales, there's still more that we need to know other than the broad strokes. We need that artistic fine brush of the portrait to be able to look with greater precision as what year, what years will we then be at what circumstance? Okay. I and hope if, that, if that, and if that, yeah. And I guess what I'm trying to say is if that, if, so if that thermal conveyor, you know, shuts down, as you said, and then Europe becomes much cooler because the heat isn't there. I, it, is it reasonable to conclude that that means that the United States goes the other direction, that that's where the heat is being pulled from? What, what happens to our continent if that conveyor belt shuts down or slows substantially? I think that's still an open question, and and I would I would have to defer to uh, really the state of the science right now, which which finds a number of issues that relate to that being not quite settled. But um, I'd be happy to follow up with you and even bring okay. some experts that could discuss that subject with you, sir. Very much appreciate that. Thank you, and I yield back. If I could uh, make a comment on that, one of the big gaps there, Congressman, is uh, our lack of knowledge of the deep ocean. So and and heat in the deep ocean. We know that ninety about ninety three percent of the excess heat that's generated from uh, greenhouse gases goes into the ocean, and as a result of uh, uh, development of the Argo system at universities, including mine, and its operation by NOAA, we know the upper two thousand meters of the ocean fairly well. Uh, but two things: number one. Uh, NOAA is having trouble uh, funding the the complete Argo system. Number two, it only goes down to 2,000 meters. We now have instruments that are are called deep Argo that would allow us to do the full depth. And that's the lower part of that overturning cycle. And one of the reasons we can't give you great uh, uh, answers to the question of what will happen as a result of uh, if if this slows down, is that we don't understand the deep part. So we have to add that to the Argo system uh, in order to be able to answer those questions. Uh, well, let's let's do that. And thank you to staff for uh, allowing Dr. Linen's uh, um, excellent answer and clarification beyond our time. Line. You back. Thank you so much. Uh, for those of you on the committee, um, you know I, as a former naval officer, normally run a tight ship, but this was so interesting and, and such a great panel. I thank you for your indulgence and in, in some of the, the time we went over on the questions, but really, really interesting. Um, I want to thank first all of our committee mem- our panel members. Before we bring this to a close, I want to thank my um, ranking member for uh, co-hosting such a, a great panel. I also just want to point out that this has been, um, I think, just a great group of members of Congress from um, both coasts, East Coast, West Coast, our our Southern Coast, the Gulf, with our member from Texas, and then our inland um, members who see how critically important um, the ocean is even to our Midwest and, and Southwestern states. So it's really a, a great group of members, and I would encourage all of our panelists um, for to feel free to reach out to any of our members through our professional staff and the um, experts on our different staffs that are engaged in these issues. And we'd be happy to continue this really fascinating discussion. And I, I do want to recognize Rep Bonamici, who has been such a leader in, um, in really protecting our oceans and looking for forward thinking legislation. So thank you everyone today for your time and your participation. The record will remain open for two weeks for additional statements from the members and for any additional questions the committee may ask of the witnesses. Um, And I encourage members, if you have further questions, to please reach out to the professional staff and, and we can drill down into some of that. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you all so much.